Welcome to this next video uh, in which we are discussing P groups. Okay, so we're now going to see another theorem concerning P groups, and this one is going to be quite interesting. Okay, so we'll give this one uh, the uninteresting title, Theorem 3. Okay, so, Theorem 3 basically tells you that you can find a normal subgroup within your P group of every possible size that Lagrange's theorem allows. Okay, so let me spell this out further. So we know that our P group has order a prime to a certain power. Okay, and we're, we've been calling this P to the power of A here. Okay, what theorem 3 is now going to tell us is that there will always exist a normal subgroup which I will call NI, uh, which will be a normal subgroup of my P group, capital P, uh, such that Ni has order p to the power of i, and this will do for absolutely all i between 0 and a. So this holds true for i is equal to 0, 1, uh, 2, all the way up to a. Okay, so, um, we've got this p group here of order p to the a. Lagrange's theorem tells us that any subgroup of that p group must have order that divides the order of the group, and therefore must have order a power of that prime. Okay, so the only possibilities are p to the 0, 1, p to the 1, p, p squared, p cubed, all the way up to p to the a. Theorem 3 is now telling me that there exists a normal subgroup of every one of those possible sizes always. Okay, so not just that there exists a subgroup of each one of the possible sizes, but there always exists a normal subgroup of each one of the sizes. Okay, and that, you can imagine, is a worthwhile thing to actually uh, be aware of. Okay, so this is a nice, interesting theorem. Okay, so how are we going to prove this? Well, we're going to prove this by induction. Okay, so we're going to start off with the most basic case, which is where uh, a is equal to 1, and then we'll induct on uh, the size of a, and we'll keep our prime completely general so that we're covering all p groups here. Okay, so we're not going to say uh, that p has to be a specific prime, it could be any of them, and this proof will work for any of them, and therefore it will prove it for all p groups. Okay, so if a is equal to 1, of course then our p group just has order this prime. Okay, so theorem 3 then becomes equivalent to saying that there must exist a normal subgroup of size 1 and a normal subgroup of size p. That's all the possibilities in this case. Okay, so of course that's easy. The trivial subgroup is your normal subgroup of size 1. The improper subgroup is your normal subgroup of size p. So that's uh, absolutely fine. The basic case where a is equal to 1 uh, is done. Okay, so I'll just tick that off. Now, of course, what we're going to do is the inductive assumption. Okay, so we're going to assume that the theorem is true uh, for, let's say, a is less than a certain value k. Assume true uh, for a is equal to k. And I've missed out a word there. Assume true for uh, a is equal to k. a is less than k, rather. Okay, so you'll assume that it's true when the order of your p group is uh, p to the power of a, where a is strictly less than some value k. Okay, and now what you want to do is prove that if that is true, that it implies that it's going to be true. The theorem is also going to be true uh, for when a is actually equal to k, i.e. when you're dealing with a p group of order p to the power of k. Okay, and if you can do this, then of course, because it's true for a is equal to 1, it will then be true for a is equal to 2. Uh, because it's true for a is equal to 1 and a is equal to 2, it will then be true for a is equal to 3. Because it's true for 1, 2, and 3, it'll be true for 4, etc. It'll end up being true for all uh, possible a's. Okay, and therefore, since we kept our arguments completely general as far as which prime we're using, it will be true for all p groups. Okay, so that's going to be our strategy to prove this. So how are we going to then prove, given the inductive assumption here, that if we've got some p group of order p to the power of k now, that it actually does contain a normal subgroup uh, of every possible size, i.e. 1, p to the power of 1, p to the power of 2, all the way up to p to the power of k. Well, somehow we need to reduce this down to a group of small, well, to a p group, of a smaller power of p 
maybe p to the k minus 1, so that we can then apply the inductive assumption and somehow use that to infer the existence of the corresponding um, normal subgroups back in here. And there's a brilliant way of doing this. We can use the correspondence theorem of quotient groups. The idea is this. Find something to quotient this out by so that we can make this smaller. Then we can apply the inductive assumption to the quotient group, which will be a p group of a smaller power of p. Okay. Then, of course, we know that normal subgroups in the quotient group correspond back to normal subgroups in the original group by the correspondence theorem, which we discussed in the video on the third isomorphism theorem and we might be able to do it from that. That's the basic strategy that we're going to employ here. Okay, so let me make this rigorous. So we need to find the thing then that we're actually going to quotient out by. We need to find a normal subgroup of size p is what we're looking for. Okay, so we're going to use theorem 1 here. We know because of theorem 1 that the center of our p group is not equal to the trivial subgroup. Okay, that means that the order of the center of this p group is some power of p, let's say p to the power of, ooh, what should I go for, p to the power of b, okay, where b um, is greater than or equal to 1 and less than or equal to a. Okay, that's by Lagrange's theorem. It must have a power uh, of p as its order so that this order divides the order of the entire group, the p group, okay, uh, and it can't have order 1. Right, now what we can do is we can apply Cauchy's theorem to the centre of the group here. So what we can now do is, by Cauchy's theorem, I can find a subgroup of the centre of my p-group of order p. Okay, so we're going to employ Cauchy's theorem here. So Cauchy's theorem, remember, is a theorem uh, concerning finite groups. If you've got the order of a group, you can take that order and factorize it into its prime factorization in the way that you learned to do in primary school. Okay, uh, and all of the primes that appear in your prime factorization, Cauchy's theorem tells you that there will exist a subgroup uh, of size each of those primes. Here we have the center of this p group. Cauchy's theorem is now telling me that I can find a um, subgroup of this of order p. Okay, so what should I call this? I'll call this M1, and you'll see why I'm calling it that in a moment. Okay, so M1 is going to be a subgroup of the center of P. Now, of course, the center of P is a is itself a subgroup of capital P, okay, and therefore uh, N1 is going to be a subgroup of capital P. And what's the order of N1? Well, it's equal to P. Okay, so why have I called this N1? Well, it's fitting with the notation here, because N1 is actually going to be my uh, normal subgroup of size, little p. Okay? Right, so how can I prove that N1 is going to be normal inside of capital P? Well, that's very easy. N1 is a subgroup of the center of P. The center of P is elements which commute with all other elements. Remember, the elements in the center, if you conjugate them by any element of the group, they do not change. Okay, so is it obvious, therefore, that for all, let's say, little g that you can possibly pick from the p group, if you conjugate n1 by little g, which means conjugate all of the elements here by little g, the set that you will end up with is n1, okay, because all of the elements inside of here will be fixed by conjugation by little g here, because they're all from the center of the p group. Okay, so g n1, g inverse will equal n1. Okay, so indeed n1 will be a normal subgroup inside of p. Okay, so I have now found a normal subgroup inside of my p group of order p. So using Cauchy's theorem, I've managed to prove that this p group of order p to the k will always have a normal subgroup of size p. Okay. What, of course, I'm now going to do is quotient out by it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to construct the quotient group of P by N1. Okay, so let's just draw a picture of this. So we'll have the P group shown here by the largest box. So I will outline this in red here, like so. And then we'll have N1 contained inside P, okay? And I'll have it splitting P down into cosets. Okay, so uh, it should be, uh, to fit, it should be some power of prime. So I'll go for uh, eight cosets, which is three to the power of, um, sorry, two to the power of three, rather. Okay, so 
just for the picture, of course, this is more generally, you know, this will have a lot of, of cosets potentially. Okay, so here is N1 then inside of P, my normal subgroup of size little p here, and I'll color it in, in orange, and it has divided capital P up into these cosets, and uh, these cosets will then become the elements in my quotient group P quotiented out by M1. Okay, so the first question to ask is how many cosets will there actually be? How many elements will there be in this quotient group P quotiented out by M1? Well, of course, each of these cosets will just be size P because it will have the same size as N1, and N1 has size P. Okay, so you just need to divide the entire order of the group, which is P to the K, by P. So the order of this will be P to the power of k minus 1, i.e. the quotient group that you've got here will be uh, another p group of size p to the power of k minus 1. You can now use the inductive assumption to say that our theorem 3 will be true for this quotient group. So for this quotient group, it will be possible to find normal subgroups of every possible size. So a normal subgroup of size p to the 0, a normal subgroup of size p to the 1, all the way up to a normal subgroup of size p to the k minus 1. Now I will call all these by bar notation. So n0 bar will be my subgroup here of size p to the 0, i.e. the trivial subgroup. Then I'll have n1 bar, and it will go all the way up to n to the k minus 1 bar here. And I'll just put the orders of all of these. This one has size 1, this one has size p, all the way up to this one, which has size p to the k minus 1. Okay, and remember, these barred subgroups, these are normal subgroups inside of uh, the quotient group, okay? So every single one of these is a normal subgroup of the quotient group, P quotiented out by M1 here. Okay, now what we're going to do is apply the correspondence theorem. So let me just remind you of how the correspondence theorem works. So on this picture, one of these subgroups will be a subcollection of the cosets in the full quotient group. Okay, so it might look something like this in green here. So let's say this represents one of them. What the correspondence theorem tells us is that there is a correspondence between subgroups of the quotient group, okay, and subgroups that are in between the normal subgroup that you quotiented out your original group by and uh, the entire group. Okay, and the way that you can go from a subgroup of the quotient group back to a subgroup that contains the thing that you use to quotient out by uh, is that you can just say, okay, look, I've got these four cosets in the case of this picture in my subgroup of the quotient group here. Just union together all of the elements that are in those cosets, and look, I return to having a subset of capital P and what you can prove is that that will be a subgroup, and indeed, if you want the proof of that, go and watch the video on the third isomorphism theorem. Here I'm just giving you a reminder of how you can go from a subgroup here to a subgroup that contains the thing that you quotiented out by, always, because it will have to contain the identity coset, which is uh, the thing that you quotiented out by, um, and which is a subgroup itself of P. Okay, right. Moreover, what um, the correspondence theorem shows us is that normal subgroups of the quotient group will correspond to normal subgroups in P. So what I can do is for each of these subgroups of the quotient group here, I can get a corresponding subgroup that completely contains the thing that I quotiented out by, and which itself is a normal subgroup inside of P. Okay, so n0, what will n0, sorry, n0 bar, what will n0 bar correspond to? Well, this is the identi uh, this is the trivial subgroup in the quotient group. Now, the trivial subgroup in the quotient group just contains the identity coset, and the identity coset will correspond to n1. Okay, so this will correspond to n1. n1 bar will correspond um, to a normal subgroup in P of size P squared, which I'll call N2, and etc. N k to the K minus 1 bar will correspond to NK, okay, because when you go backwards in this way, how much will your subgroup expand by? How big will your corresponding subgroup that is in between uh, N1 and P be? Well, when you union together all the cosets, how many elements are in each coset? There's P in each coset. So you're going to multiply your size by P. So this one, when you go back 
uh, to what it corresponds to as a subgroup of actual p here will be multiplied by p, so this will go up to p squared, this one has evidently gone up to p, this one will go up to p to the k here, and all the ones in between will do the same. So the overall message here is that because I can find normal subgroups of the quotient group of every single size, these will correspond to normal subgroups uh, in my original group, capital P. So all of these will be normal subgroups inside of P of sizes P, P squared, all the way up to P to the K. Okay, and if you're not familiar with what I've just done here, please do watch the video on the third isomorphism theorem because that's absolutely crucial for what we've done here. This is the correspondence theorem which is usually given as part of the third isomorphism theorem and which is discussed in the video on the third isomorphism theorem. Okay, so by the inductive assumption I can find normal subgroups of every single size in the quotient group. These will then correspond to a normal subgroup inside of P of size um, little p, which will be this n1 subgroup, uh, n2 of size p squared, all the way up to nk of size pk. Okay, there's only one missing now, which of course is my n0 here, which I'll have to add on, which will be the trivial subgroup inside of p. That's very easy to find. That'll have size 1. Okay, that's always going to be there, so that's not a problem. So we just have to add that one onto the list. Okay, and then we have our complete cohort. I have uh, my cohort of normal subgroups of every uh, single possible size. So if it's true that indeed theorem 3 is true for a p group of size uh, p to the k minus 1, then it will also be true that theorem 3 is true for a p group of size p to the k. And then what you can obviously do is say, okay, if it's true for um, a is equal to 1, then it will be true for a is equal to 2, it will be true for a is equal to 3, it will be true for a is equal to 4, and it will just continue going on. So indeed, theorem 3 does hold true for p groups uh, of any power of a prime, okay, and for any prime, because nowhere in here do we require p to be a specific prime. Okay, this all applies no matter what the prime is. So indeed, any p group that you have, you will have a normal subgroup of every single possible size uh, that you can have by the Grange's theorem. Okay, again, we'll have a break here, and then in the next video, we'll look at theorem 4.